not very good maintenance or just wasn't upkept for many years. And then um, in the late 80s, the Michigan Hossa Society was looking for um, a partner to have some kind of hosta. Look at all those rocks there, that's mm -hmm. it. And so um, uh, the, the, the idea to chance, change this into a hosta collection oh, nice. uh, came up. So they, keeping with the theme, they outlined the beds with, with some different yeah. small rocks. A gravel, a gravel road here. There's a, there's actually a waterfall. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull up off here. Off here. I'll get turned around here. There's a little waterfall. You might wanna. I don't know if you wanna hop out and take a little. Yeah. Video of that. But there's a, there's a recirculating pump that's a, that you have as a waterfall. Where is it? Oh, this I'll, I'll drive over. Oh, okay. I think I can get turned around here without too much trouble. I'm always, we're only supposed to go one way. Technically, we are going one way. It's just the wrong way. The wrong way. But you are with the managing director, so I guess we can make we can make up the rules as we. It's only a suggestion. Right. <laughs> so uh, when here, when this was a rock garden here, if he had this recirculating waterfall going, we this isn't exactly how it was, but it, it's it starts up here and it goes all the way down and trickles right down back into the lake. So it just kind of follow this uh, kind of. Um, down, downhill theme. Mm -hmm. so Good. I don't think you can see it too well unless you're once you get the bump. You can see it a little bit down through there. Probably. So there, there's the waters. It trickles over the path and lands in that little collecting oh, yeah. pool. Oh, okay. And then it trickles out the back of the collecting pool and just goes right down into the lake. I'll go ahead and get turned around and we'll, we'll go all the way around the lake. So many nice places here where you can get beautiful pictures. The fall is fantastic, obviously with all these trees. Oh, I'll bet. Um, yeah. You get a lot of fall color and um, a lot of, uh, just really a lot of great scenes. And because we have so much, uh, so many different species of trees, like the sassafras are some of the, the first trees to change color. Um, and that happens in late September already and then but then some of the oaks don't change color till you know into November. So we have a nice long season of fall color which is really great. And October is our highest month of attendance. Really? Like, which kind of surprised me when I first came here. Yeah. You would think a garden May or June or maybe even April with all mm -hmm. the flowers. Um, but um, October easily is our highest uh, month of, of, uh, because of the color change? Mm -hmm. color, yeah. Well, and there, Michigan is known for everybody yeah. drives up here yeah. for the color changes. Mm -hmm. That's a little nice terrace one. here. This is a real popular it. spot yeah. for weddings. Yeah. Small, obviously small weddings. But, uh, is actually a, a glacial lake or what we call a kettle lake. Um, back when the glaciers were here 10,000 or so years ago, two lobes of the glaciers kind of came together right in this region, this Irish Hills region. And as they started to recede, um, they deposited all the different soils and rocks and sediment and, and, and different um, uh, materials that they had settled here and that's what helped form all these hills and valleys if you will through this Irish Hills region. Well there's kettle holes and kettle lakes. Uh, kettle lakes are basically where imperviable material is deposited in these lowland areas and collected water and it just sits there. But the kettle holes have um, permeable material so they're wet but they never really hold water. They don't know why. Um, so we'll see a couple of examples. We'll see one example of one on our way back. 
The uh, Route 12 Michigan Avenue yes. starts at the Detroit River and goes all the way to Lake Michigan. Mm -hmm. And it was a it was a mammoth trail. Most of the people here thousands of years ago uh, traveled by water, mm -hmm. but when they did travel by land, they used that mammoth trail. And an example is Saline, Michigan, is named that because of uh, a, a saltwater spring that was wow. there. And like every all the time, they find uh, mammoth bones on Route 12 and teeth and tusks wow. and everything. Very cool. Right up here, so there's not much to see, but. Um, uh, there's a parking lot and our trailhead is up there so we have um, three trails that kind of start and end in that spot we have over uh, we have more trails but we have over five miles of hiking trails well, you can probably get lost together. and some right. some do <laughs> off off the record not really but um, we we have a wide array of hiking users um, oh nice we, we have some that will come in and say you know gee your map is terrible we got lost and others come in and say, wow, your hiking trails are great. We did them like three <laughs> times. It was wonderful. So um, uh, we were, try we're always trying to figure out expectations of uh, visitors. And, um, uh, and my wife and I, we, we just started kind of getting into bicycling. And um, Yeah, so we're we, back into it now, too. So we go to different bike paths and bike trails. And similarly... That ought to be um, a good idea. Can you ride bikes here, you say? You can ride bikes. Okay, well, that, we ought to bring our bikes up then. You can certainly ride bikes. You can ride them in. Uh, a lot of people bring them on their, you know, on their bike racks. Yeah, we'd have to put them on the bike rack. That way, too. Um, we have walkers, joggers, hikers, a lot of dog walkers. We are dog friendly. As long as your dog's on a leash, you clean up after. Mm -hmm. um, you have dogs here. So we're on, we're on Woodland Drive now, and um, this winds through the most of the Woodland area. And um, it's about a three mile loop from the visitor center through the Woodland Drive back to the visitor center. That wall back there, somebody had to lift a lot of rock to get that thing together. Yep. We had a big, big tree that came down here in that big windstorm earlier this spring. Oh. And usually we just leave the, yeah. usually we just leave the trees sit. But this was a nice, um, nice red oak. Yeah. So um, we've been harvesting some of the wood from it and trying to repurpose it and use it for different things. But we really try to just let Mother Nature take its course. Mm -hmm. It's not so easy to see this time of the year, but certainly um, in the fall when the leaves are off the plants, you really see. Uh, old logs and just laying and decomposing. In, in, in the area. And that's really uh, good, uh, good forest management is to let the microbial activity and the, uh, to decompose the bark and the wood and uh, other animals and wildlife will use logs and branches for um, uh, protection or, or um, for homes or habitat. Mm -hmm. A lot of deer back in there. We have a lot of deer here. Um, what do they do with the plants? Well, I think we're, I think we're partially lucky in that um, because we're surrounded by a lot of farmland. We don't have um, a lot of pressure from deer all year round. But because um, uh, there's especially like this past winter, because the we didn't have much snow cover, so the corn fields, soybean fields, there's a lot of refuse in those fields where they could feed on. But um, but when there is winter, hard winters, um, they'll come in and they'll feed on the conifers and that. So some of the garden areas we do protect with, with deer fencing or electric fence. Um, we'll use some organic products um, that, like fish emulsions and that, that will, and dried blood that will um, discourage away, deer from yeah. feeding on different things. Um, there are sections of the Hasa Garden, even now, where some of those have been um, fed on by deer, but um, it's not too bad, and um, like I said, I think we're lucky in that there's enough other things around here for them to eat, so we don't, they don't wipe out just one thing all over the place. This, so this is a kettle hole here, and although you can't see the physical bottom of it, um, it's if we walked through there, it's probably not quite like a bog, but you probably get muddy shoes at this mm -hmm. time of the year. After a heavy rain, it might be ankle-deep water down there for a few days. 
um, but there's these depressions all throughout the Irish Hills. The ones that hold water are kettle lakes, and the ones that don't hold water are considered to be kettle holes. And it was just a matter of the different material that settled out from the um, glaciers, whether mm -hmm. it was permeable or impermeable. So a kettle, Hidden Lake is not spring-fed, at least not above-ground spring-fed. Um, like I said, that pond was excavated. Um, it's, a man, it's basically a man-made pond. There you can see some of the where we'll leave some of the tree trunks and that. Just, we'll just mm -hmm. basically leave them there, even along the road. And, um, we'll clear, if one falls across the road, we'll clear the road, but pretty much just let it go. Kind of so. this, this is near the end of the hiking trail. Um, so if you, follow this, if you follow the trail this way, it circles around and, and it'll take you back to the lake. If you turn right, go right back to the visitor center. If you turn left, it'll take you back to the trailhead. And then you can see where the hiking trail crosses the road and starts heading up. And it goes up around the kettle hole that way. Oh, okay. Now, when we get to the top of Juniper Hill, off to the left, there's some nice, really nice views. They're a little bit limited, but they're still nice views of Hidden Lake. Behind us is another kettle hole that we actually we kind of mow it. We'll, we'll come around the curve and be able to see it better. But this once we get past some junipers, you'll start to see you'll start to see him like. You can kind of see it's down through there. Oh yeah. In the, in the fall, like when the from late fall through early spring, this is just a wonderful view. You get a little oh, more. Oh so yeah. like, And then there's another little view going back that way. And then, and then you'll see the top of the pavilion where the project bloom beds are located. Mm -hmm. And you'll catch a couple glimpses of the visitor center too, the visitor center building. And ob then you'll obviously you'll see the conservatory. And this is a kettle hole. There's, those are sassafras trees in the bottom. And then these conifers also here are part of the. This we're at the upper level or the um, overlook of the Harper collection. All these dwarf and rare conifers. You get a much better. Well, you know, I'm going to pull in here. You might, I can do this. And get turned around. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Wow, look at this. That is so beautiful. So it's really a great collection of what we call conifers or cone bearing plants. Um, most are evergreen, but there are some deciduous conifers in, 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 uh, in this collection too. Um, but obviously the different colors, shapes, textures, and sizes um, really just make a really great collection. Mm -hmm. Most of these plants would be focal points in a garden or a landscape bed by themselves. And here they've taken them and put them all together um, into one garden. And how uh, one one of the um, interesting things about this collection is that it started at a garden in Moline, Illinois. And um, a, man, a gentleman named Chubb Harper, um, his friend was Jack Weichel, uh, who worked here. Uh -huh. And he asked Jack if he left his dwarf conifer collection of 350 plants, if he left it in his will to Hidden Lake Gardens in the MSU, would they take it? And they said, oh yeah, we would take it. And then a couple of years later, he said, well, if I wanted you to take it now, would you take it? And he said, well, well okay, yeah, we'll take it. And so um, it started with 350 plants that were bald and burlapped in his garden in Moline, Illinois. Oh and shipped God. with five different trucks, semi-trucks, to, uh -huh. to Hidden Lake Gardens and planted. That was in, in 1981. And then, um, let's see if I can we'll try to get turned around here a little bit. And then we'll go around and come up the other way. And then he came back, um, that was 350 plants then, and then he donated more a few years later, and we've collected a few more from other donors. So we've, now we have um, about 500, I think we have 517, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say a specific number. We have about 500 different um, varieties of 
dwarf conifers in this collection. So obviously this garden looks beautiful now, but this is a great garden in the winter time. Oh mm -hmm. yeah, with the snow. Yeah, exactly. You know, with the conservatory backdrop, and mm -hmm. it's just it's just a really nice. Thing. Very short stint again, but then you'll see the picnic pavilion come up on the right hand side. So some folks do come. And you can obviously you can picnic in the raised bed area there, um, but we have we actually have a, a large pavilion for picnics. Years ago, Hidley Gardens was a, a destination for people when going for a Sunday drive was real popular. Mm -hmm. So a lot of families would come here on Sunday afternoon, pack a lunch. Oh, yeah. And so that was one of the inspirations for having a pavilion for picnicking. Um, that, was, that was really popular back when Sunday drives were, were popular. This curve will be um, more or less in the middle of the conifer collection. to the right is a newer section. Um, the road and up the left was the original collection from the early 1980s. Oh, these, okay. these were added um, about eight to 10 years later mm -hmm. and, and subsequently plants after that too. Also, now, did you have a landscape artist or who was um, Well, through, through Michigan State University, um, a landscape architect did design this garden. Oh, okay. Um, they actually went to uh, Illinois and saw the plants growing in the garden in Illinois, and then um, that helped them to start to lay out the different patterns uh -huh. and um, kind of put it together. The Hosta, the Hosta Garden really, um, it, they did get some um, design help with laying out the beds, but as far as the plants go, it's really just, I don't want to say a hodgepodge, but they're, they're, all, they're constantly getting divided and replanted, right. and so they right. move around quite a bit. There are some beds that have certain themes, but um, overall it doesn't have a real strong, specific design pattern. A 
do I'll I'll be able to loop up here a little bit here too. I'm going to tip Be a little bit tippy here. We won't. We won't tip over. Not gonna be loud. Okay. 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 This, the, um, this is really, this is just kind of a fun fact. Um, we had a large conifer here that was in decline. We had to take it out. It was, it was a shrub that was probably about, oh, probably 15 feet in diameter and 10 to 15 feet tall. And um, when we took it out, we realized that there was a groundhog issue here. Oh. And there were two, like an exit and an entry hole um, with these groundhogs here. And... Um, so we redesigned the bed, but we, were, we tried all kinds of different ways to get rid of these groundhogs. We just couldn't do it. And somebody finally said, you need some dry ice. So you put a chunk of dry ice down the hole, and then you cover up both holes with like a board or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I think it's too much buildup of carbon dioxide, and they basically suffocate. <laughs> um, and... Um, we did that. We, and we don't. We didn't think it worked, but there's, the holes are. We, keep, we kept covering up the holes with soil, and I see that the holes are not being redug. So oh, we got them. I don't know. We have to tell Sean. It's kind of a kind of a pain. I guess a kind of a painless way. Yeah. It's almost like a carbon monoxide poison Poisoning, kind of thing. Yeah. Although in this case, it's just too much carbon dioxide. And, and, um, Since my name is Chuck, I like to call it a woodchuck. Woodchuck, yeah. <laughs> well, I never, I never realized why they were called woodchucks. We always called them groundhogs in Ohio. But when my wife and I were bicycling, we were actually biking near Toledo, one of the metro parks, and we encountered a, um, a, a woodchuck ran across the path in front of us and screwed up the trunk of a tree. <laughs> I'd never I'd never seen that happen. I just, I, I, we were both before. I didn't know I could climb. I didn't know that either. Yeah, we we live uh, adjacent to Swan Creek Park, so we, wow. we've got a, a valley in the back, yeah. and it's, uh, it's, it's in Toledo, but it looks like a different world. Mm -hmm. So you can see when we say dwarf conifers, some truly are pretty dwarf, they say pretty small, um, but others not so much. Not. <laughs> not so much.
spruces. Another thing, we had several very large spruces here, and they, they were kind of in decline. They weren't looking so great, and they were really detracting from the garden. So we took, we just removed them, and we just filled the bed in, reseeded the bed to be turf grass. We just did this back in late May, early June. Oh, okay. um, but we may come back another year or two and maybe put a new bed in or some different plantings or something there. We have an advisory group that comes in and uh, uh, comes in twice a year and works, walks through here with, the, with our staff. And we always talk about what, what to do both short term and long term. Uh -huh. and, uh, a lot of times with a group of 15 different individuals there are a lot of opinions. Sometimes right. there's 15 different opinions. <laughs> so we'll share all those opinions and we'll say, well, We'll just plant grass here for now, and then next year we'll revisit it. Right, yeah. Eventually we come up with some good ideas. Or sometimes there'll be great ideas, but it takes a while to find the plants. Mm -hmm. Since a lot of them are kind of rare or unusual. At uh, Chanel Arboretum, they have a lot of, along with their plants and everything, they have a lot of sculptures. Oh, like art sure. of sculptures okay. in some of the different yeah. gardens, you know? Yeah. That people have donated or they commissioned or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of interesting, that too. Is. Of course, that's our, uh, those are the, the four um, poly houses. Two of them we take the plastic off in the summertime because uh, they're really just used for overwintering. Yeah. Um, but the two in the back, um, one is a pro the small one's a propagation house where we do cuttings and grafting. And then the big poly house, that's where we force the bulbs for a spring bulb show. And um, a lot of the uh, annual flats, when they go from seedlings into flats, will go in there and uh, different container plants. And some overwintering things too. All the, those the two front houses really aren't heated. The, the, the plants just need just need to be exposed to outdoor exposures. Your narrator here has been Paul Pfeiffer. Paul, what's your title here? You have it. Uh, the managing director. Managing director, Hidden Lake Gardens. <laughs>